how many of us have lost something, someone that we wish to reclaim? During the time of this pandemic, we have lost loved ones. We've lost time, but yet we have reclaimed our health as many people have ran along the river, making new dishes, sharing on social media. Well, on April 1, 2007, I lost my father, Calvin Hill Jr. in Oklahoma City in a head-on collision. He was a firefighter for Oklahoma City, the first to break the colored line. But we shared the love of family history, of food, and his death birthed a new me. I went through a quarter-life crisis and I began to see how can I heal from this pain and turn that pain into a purpose, almost like an alchemist. And so that brings in learning my family history because you cannot go forward if you do not know where you have gone. And that brings in Henrietta. Henrietta was born into slavery. She was bought for $900 in Georgia to the Burkhalter family. That family, when the daughter married into the George Washington Speed family, who fought in the Confederacy in Mississippi, where they were married, moved on to Corsicana, Texas, where he became the bank president. And Henrietta helped to not only raise her own children, but their children as well. And so when emancipation happened, it would take dozens of years later before Henrietta was free and to reunite with Giles Burkhalter, her son, a product of trauma and understanding that that is where she died in June 1908, around the time of the statehood of Oklahoma. And that's where my family has been for the last four generations. And for me, I thought about women like Henrietta, how they not only helped to create new life, but were never paid for their labor. Yet she planted the seed in Giles and who later became a father, a husband, an agripreneur in Eufaula, Oklahoma, and helped to help feed his own community. And he went on to birth the next generation. And so I wanna introduce you to the tale of two grandmothers, Minnie Mae Crawford on my mom's side and Ruby Burkhalter Talver on my father's side. These two women represent uh, what we are seeing in America. One out of the 10 Americans, according to the government, have diabetes, yet one out of five black women over the age of 55 have diabetes, yet my Minnie Mae, Nanny died from complications. She grew up with dealing with rural life, dealing with trauma, and we know the power of what it means to self-medicate. We enjoyed her desserts and getting ice cream, and, but how much did these refined foods play into her health? Whereas Ruby grew up to later be a nurse for 35 years in Oklahoma City and making healing tonics, both were women of faith, yet one is still living now beyond the age of 90. And so I had to think about how do I honor the ancestry within me? And so I went on to create Native Soul Kitchen. Native Soul means nourishing authentic traditions that including values of sustainability, oneness, and love, and realizing that we have to begin to rethink the space of kitchens, not only as sites of trauma that we knew from our history, but create them as sites of healing. And so I became a mom and I wanted to reclaim that space in the kitchen again. And that's where I began cooking up new memories, new recipes, remixing new traditions, and began realizing the power in our food. We can either choose to heal or kill our meals, our families, or our next generation. And so it had me in one class, a student asked, well, we're learning about African foods and making uh, food that can heal us, but have you even been to Africa? And that raised the question like, no, I haven't. And so part of my honoring family was also doing the DNA test, learning of my connection 
and heritage of Fulanis in present-day northern Nigeria and being able to learn how to prepare the meals, be received in the community in Kano and taking for Denono, which is a milk and millet dish. And so it led me to learn about one particular study that I wanted to highlight of Stephen O'Keefe out of University of Pittsburgh um, did a study like a, a, you've seen the show Family Swap, imagine food swap. You have two communities in rural South Africa eating an American diet uh, for two weeks of everything that we know, burgers, fries, and all that jazz. But then also African Americans eating a mostly African diet. That African diet was high in fiber, low in fat compared to the American diet, high in fat, low in fiber that we know. Well, within the span of those two weeks, he saw a dramatic difference in the gut microbiome. Basically, more polyps, um, the increase of biomarkers of cancer risk was found along with increase in inflammation in the colon among those Africans who had an American diet versus those who were on an African diet had lower inflammation in the colon and decrease biomarkers showing color cancer risk. And that was profound because we know in the world of epigenetics that our food, like anything else, can become on and off, turn on and off light switches in our environment. And so I began to realize why are we not investing the same amount of dollars in discovering these heritage foods as much as we have in the Mediterranean diet. In other words, if we choose to invest in one culture versus another, we show a value in one over the other. The African American community, the African diaspora, we are not monolithic. And so our diet should be invested in just as much as anyone else if we know what food can do to help heal us. And so I began thinking, what are we telling the next generation? My daughter, Ruby, had an opportunity to be um, at the U.S. State of Women uh, back in 2016 when Michelle Obama came to speak. At the time, Let's Move was moving, and there was a focus of childhood obesity and knowing that in my generation, my children were to die before me. And I began thinking, what, what, how are we as a family, as a community, as women can play a role in changing the trajectory of our children's health. One teacher who was Ruby's preschool teacher thought that junk food as a reward was appropriate. And I spoke to her as a mother and I said, well, would you feed these foods to your children? And we know the answer. So why is it acceptable in our community here in Ward 8 in Anacostia? And yes, she was another African-American woman. And so I began to realize how much have we liberated ourselves out of the kitchen to the point that we don't see the value anymore. And so in that moment, the alchemist came to me and I said, I want to begin to see how do we build a legion of food freedom fighters on the front line and for women to begin seeing themselves as these food sheroes that we need to help save and heal our communities. And so that led me to think about what are the characters that our children are seeing? How is our food being represented in our communities, in the media? We know entertainment is a powerful tool that helps shape the minds of how children see themselves. When we think about Tintin, and I thought about how do we create an aspirational character that encourages our children to see themselves as food heroes, to go on these great adventures, traveling and learning about foods, African heritage foods that can heal their families and be their medicine. And that's when I reconnected to my own passion of writing books, children's books, and learning how food can be that superpower for little Wanda, who's now a 
a patent design doll that I created with the idea that she can help inspire the next generation through these stories. And we went on to donate these books in Nigeria and creating more books um, in other African languages because we want to ensure that we not only validate the cultural identity of what food represents, but also the languages as well. Food is not just medicine, it's identity, it's culture, it's our medicine, but it also is our power. And it's now time to reclaim that power. And so we traveled to Nigeria in 2016 to plant that seed, to begin thinking about how we can connect to our sisters across the Atlantic and realize that we have the same goal in common to help heal our families one meal at a time. We went to travel to a local IDP camp where those who were impacted by Boko Haram had to flood into Abuja. And we fed not just Indomie noodles, which is very popular, but also real meats and rice and vegetables and a whole meal served by the local Muslim women. Because we knew that if we help to prepare the meals that heal the women, we can help heal a generation. And so we went on to recognize that we not only need to, as Wanda, women advancing nutrition, dietetics, and agriculture, we need to educate our communities, educate ourselves, advocate for the food policy changes that we need, and innovate by becoming the healthy food entrepreneurs in our communities. And so here in Washington, D.C., we, during the course of the pandemic, created the Wanda Academy, bringing women to local women farms, learning about bitter leaf, unjama jama, Swiss chard, collard greens, kale, vegetables that they never seen picked up out of the ground and learning how to prepare. And this was beyond education, economic job status. These were lawyers as much as someone who's retired on Medicare, Medicaid. We have a need to democratize nutrition education in this country and make it available for all. So all can be food citizens and rise up to understand that we are part of democracy and democracy means choice. And we have limited the choices in our food system for those of us to begin to reconnect and liberate our communities. And so through our work, we recognize that one way to do that is our sisterhood suppers, bringing women together to have deep, meaningful conversations and connections and understanding the power of the table, not the red table talk type, but the kitchen table that can bring women together to help have those intentional conversations and be that cultural engineer in our communities of reclaiming that Sunday supper and saying, how do we remix our recipes that heal? How do we see the value in our stories? How do we create a community cookbook that captures the value of the foods of our heritage that we can pass a new legacy to our generation and shift the power to reclaiming the power that already lies within? And so today I ask you, will you reclaim your power, the power that we have within us, we have so many hidden stories that have not been claimed. From Harriet Tubman, who was a cook and a nurse, who not only created a way out of no way and freed women and men and children, but also understood that cooking was part of her livelihood. Or Georgia Gilmore out of Alabama, who created a secret supper club to help feed a movement with Dr. King um, as one of her tried and true loyal customers. Or Karen Washington, who's an urban farmer who has coined the term food apartheid that, that creates the true definition of what we see in our communities of structural barriers. Or Harriet, not only Harriet, but Dr. Shariki Kumunika, who was my first mentor in nutrition epidemiology when I didn't even know the career of nutrition even existed as the only African-American student at Oklahoma State University. Or Dr. Evelyn Creighton, who became the first African-American president of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. These are the women's stories that need to be documented and told and empower women to believe that they can be more they can be a great lunch lady, but they can be more. And to know that there are a, a, a wide range of titles and 
talents and testimonies of how women have used food as power from food historians like Dr. Jessica Harris, who we know affectionately through the book High on the Hog, but understanding that we have the ability to create the change that already is within us. And that means unlocking that power to see that our food, our heritage food is our medicine. Thank you.